abusive. <laughs> yes. Um, gosh, I, I, I hope I, I can live up and <laughs> up to that because that's kind of intimidating. But, um, uh, you know, I, I do love fly fishing and I fish with a reel uh, as well as a tenkar rod. And I do like to make that really clear because, um, you know, some people just you know, unless you can do it on a rod and reel, it doesn't count. Um, but I will say that I started with a rod and reel and I didn't, I, I enjoyed fly fishing, but I wasn't in love with it um, for a number of reasons. And I was okay, um, but I don't think I was passionate about it. And then when I found Tenkara as a, as a method of fly fishing, I really started to enjoy it more. I also, um, my success rate kind of exploded. And um, I just think I became a better angler and then went back to my rod and reel and was very like, wow, when did I get so you know, good on a rod and reel. And I mean, there's, I'm not a great angler, but I could hold my own. And um, the improvement that I experienced from my time on Tenkara really just um, blew my mind. I wasn't expecting it to, to be so transferable, but the skills really are transferable because everything you do on a Tenkara rod relies on your skill set, okay? You you can never fall back to your reel because you don't have a reel. So from the moment you connect with that fish, it's all about what you are going to do in response to that fish and how you're going to use that rod, which is your only tool. And so it really boils down um, to very basic skill sets and being able in the moment to sort of use what you have to problem solve and, you know, figure the skill set out. So I'm going to jump back and forth um, to talking to you and uh, going in and out of a, a PowerPoint presentation. So we're going to hop into that presentation now. And we are going to put uh, questions at the end, just because often as we get through the presentation, we'll answer things that um, that you're wondering about. And if if you have a question, write it down so you don't forget. If I don't get to it, um, if I don't address it, we'll try to answer it um, at the end. And if we don't have time, we can move into a virtual meetup room that has been created to continue uh, the conversation there if you have questions and you have the time to uh, to pop over there. So, um, and you can also always email me. Um, it's Karen, K-A-R-I-N at zenflyfishinggear.com. So it's a pretty straightforward email. All right, here we go. Uh host disabled participant screen sharing. I nope. can't believe the host <laughs> did that. I most certainly would never, ever have done that. And oh, gosh, <laughs> why don't I just, why don't I just, uh, why don't I just make you co-host and then everything will happen for you. Sorry about that. That's okay. All right, let's see if- Just testing I'm you. I'm good to go, yes. Here we go. <laughs> Woo. <laughs> All right, Tinkara, it will improve your regular fly fishing. I promise if you spend a little time on it, it will make you a better angler. So um, Tinkara, for those of you that are not familiar with it, uh, it's a telescoping rod. They are carbon fiber um, and they're ultra lightweight. So these rods generally weigh two to three ounces. And as you can see by this photo, the sections nest down into each other. So, um, you know, a 12 foot 
uh, tenkara rod uh, collapses down to about 20 inches. Uh, there are no guides, there is no reel, and they are very flexible. And they are unique and different to a regular fly rod in that they flex 360 degrees, meaning when you make or roll a tenkara rod blank, there is no spine and, and no belly like a traditional fly rod. So a traditional fly rod um, has a spine, a belly. That's why you have to line those guides up carefully. And it is designed to flex along a certain plane, okay? Tenkara rods are not like that. They are the Gumby fly rods of the fly fishing world, okay? Highly flexible, the, the, the yoga fly rods, um, if you will. You use a fixed length of line. And traditionally, you match the length of the line to approximately the length of the rod. So if you had a 12 foot tenkara rod, you would approximately use a 12 foot line with um, four to five feet maybe of tippet, okay? Um, and Ideally and traditionally, they are used for small waters and small fish, okay? But they have much greater capabilities, especially as your skill set improves on them and you start to understand their flex dynamics, then you can land much bigger fish on these rods. Um, not all tenkara rods are designed uh, for heavy loads, um, but most of them can handle much bigger fish than you would ever associate with the tenkara method. And what I love about the method is that it relies on skills versus a reel. So when I talk about tenkara, I like to talk about I like to talk about it or address it um, based on layers. I, I say fly fishing is like an onion. It has layers and, you know, every layer is kind of dependent or builds upon the next. And so just to go over these six layers of fly fishing uh, before we dive into them from a Tinkar perspective. You know, you first need to know um, where fish live, right? Um, because they're not everywhere, right? I mean, not every body of water hosts fish. And even if you find a body of water, the fish don't necessarily live everywhere. So they have certain habitats that they like to hang out in and certain structures. Um, and depending on whether it's fresh or saltwater or lake fishing, and depending on the species, they're all a little different. Now, nobody needs to become a fish biologist, but you know, it's worth spending a little time Googling, reading a book here and there and getting an idea when you approach a river, where should you be looking to find fish? Okay, where are they most likely to hang out? That is the very first thing. Because if you don't know that, doesn't matter how good of a caster you are, right? You're never gonna catch a fish if you're putting your line where there are no fish. So layer number two is actually reaching the fish. So once you kind of have an idea of where fish like to hang out in different kinds of water, then you need to be able to reach that fish, right? And that's where casting comes in. And it's a big thing. Casting, you know, can become very complicated, very complex with double hauling and spay casting and all these things. But at the very basic level, it's getting, you know, a relatively about 30 to 40 feet of line to a target. Right. Um, and I think a lot of people can struggle with that piece. OK, and they can get frustrated before they ever get to any of the other layers because there is a skill set involved in that. 
But once you get casting down, then you have to get flies and presentation. And as we all know, if you, you talk about flies, you can go down an entire rabbit hole, right, of flies. I mean, just look at how many fly tires there are in this, in this expo. Matching the hatch, different kinds of flies. I remember when I was learning about fly fishing, I just remember looking at a friend's fly box and just being overwhelmed and thinking, I'm expected to know what all these flies are and what their names are and when they should be used and how to use them. It, there was, it was a tremendous amount of information. But once you kind of get that fly, right, then what do you do with it? Presentation is a hugely important part of fly fishing that isn't always talked a lot about. So you know where fish are, you can get your line to them, you've picked a fly, but what you do with it, how you maneuver that fly and how you offer it to the fish determines whether or not that fish actually is going to strike, okay? So you can, you can throw flies all day, but if you're not presenting it properly in a way that actually makes that fish motivated to hit it, you're not going to have any success. So that's another really big chunk in fly fishing. And I like to say those first three layers are, I mean, those are big layers, okay? And a lot of people spend a lot of time in those layers. And if you can get to that point where fish are actually starting to go after your fly, you are halfway there. That's where I say that's the halfway mark. If you're getting fish to actually move and hit your fly, you're 50% there. So the next, the next, um, layer is setting the hook. And that involves timing and muscle reflexes. So a lot of that has to do with recognizing the cues and then building muscle reflexes to respond to those cues once you can identify them. And it takes a lot of practice to get that hook set. Because, because it is a metorical response, okay? Layer uh, five is fish management, okay? So you know where fish are, you're casting to them, you're picking the right flies, you're manipulating your fly and you're presenting it in a way that actually makes that fish want to go after that fly. And now you've got enough practice down and muscle reflexes that you're setting the hook. Now, what do you do? Now you're attached to this fish, right? Now you actually have to play that fish and manage that fish and stay connected with it. Because a lot of anglers will connect to the fish, but then they lose it, right? They throw the hook, you know, breaks off well, one thing or another. But a lot of anglers actually hook into fish but they, they don't have those successful landings. And that's because they're failing in the play or the actual, the landing part of it, okay? So those, those are the six layers. Um, and I, I like to break down Tenkara sort of along those lines. So where fish live is something that you can kind of just Google and do some homework about. Um, it's great to go to a river, take a look around and see if you can find, you know, what the books are talking about and take a guided trip and use that guide to teach you where fish live. But then there's casting, okay? And a lot of people back several years ago, uh, when Tinkar was first uh, introduced, didn't have a lot of respect for the method because they said Tinkar was for people who didn't know how to cast, all right? Or it's dapping or, you know, there's no real casting involved. Well, casting is different in Tinkara depending on the line you use. So 
The rod is lighter and it's more flexible, which means it's also more sensitive. So when you move that rod and you flex it, the load is going to be much more pronounced. You can feel it and you can see it. It's very dramatic, okay? Those bends, those curves. I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of like a bamboo rod. It's a slower motion, but it's very exaggerated. And because you don't have guides, and because the line is attached directly to the tip of the rod, it's like an extension of your own hand or your arm, and you can feel everything. There, is, there are no guides. The line isn't running down the exterior of the rod and then being dampened in the real unit. It's directly attached to the line, which means you feel everything. So it's easier to learn and actually understand the whole concept of timing. You know, when I was learning uh, to cast, I remember taking a lesson and um, my casting instructor saying, you know, bring it forward when you feel the load. And I kept saying, what, you know, like, what, what am I feeling? I don't, I don't understand what that means. What, uh, you know, feeling the load, feeling when the rod loads, it was a very discreet sensation and it was very hard to identify, especially because it only lasted a moment, right? Until you moved the rod in another direction and it disappeared. So it was sort of like this fleeting sensation that I had to somehow grasp onto and internalize it so I could identify it next time, which was really hard. On a Tenkara rod, because everything is so tactile and the feedback is so intensified, you learn that timing much easier and much faster. You identify those tactile cues um, in, in, in such a, you know, sort of in your face sort of way that it's, it's easier to say, oh, that's what I'm talking about. Okay, I can feel the rod go back. Okay, that is what you're talking about, that sensation. When you know what that sensation is and you get good at, at casting, then you can go into a rod and reel, which is much more discreet. And you pick up on those cues because you actually know what you're looking for then. And you know what you're feeling for. And it's easier to identify. So when you cast on a Tenkara rod, if you're fishing it traditionally, which is that short setup, a short line, then you have to cast it differently than if you're using what I call um, a fusion cast or American style, where you're using a heavier, longer line. And I'm gonna show you quickly what those look like. So when you cast a regular um, rod and reel, you use a power grip, which is this picture on the left side of your screen. It's the thumb up on top. And the reason you use this power grip is because you're engaging or want to engage your shoulder and you don't want to utilize your wrist. Your thumb is also the most powerful and strongest um, finger or appendage in your hand. And so when you put your thumb on top, you have much more power in the palm of your hand. It's a stronger grasp and it, it forces you into more of your elbow and shoulder to use. A precision grip is one where your index finger is on top of the rod. Now, when you do this, you don't engage your elbow, you don't engage your shoulder. It forces all of the movement into the wrist, almost like you're pointing at something. The shorter 
the line, the more you're going to use a precision grip or the lighter the line. Because if you try to use a power grip on an ultra light Tinkara line, you would it would be overkill. Okay, you would you would plow it into the ground because these flexible, you know, slingshot type of rods don't need that much power. It's very very minimal effort to send the line out. But as you get into heavier, longer lines, then you actually need to modify your grip. And so the casts, whoops, look like this. So this is a traditional Tenkara cast. It's an ultralight line and it's very small. You will see that I'm using my wrist and my elbow stays close to the side and I'm not using my shoulder at all. It's just a very, very small movement with a very slight pause up at the top. And that allows the line to unfold in the back. I can cast with either hand this way, which is really cool because it allows me to get uh, into shots and make shots that are slightly different. Okay, but very, very small movement to just flick that line out. But as I get into um, a longer line, I need to change what I do. These are also great for bow and arrow casts into little pool or pocket water. Very easy to just flick those out there. All right, so I can do backhand casts. I can go over my shoulder and get different angles and it lays out the line super easy. If I go to a mid-length line, okay, you'll notice my cast slows down just slightly and, oops. I'm still using a precision grip but I'm moving my arm just a little bit more. It's not so tucked into my body tight, tight. And you'll see I can make really easy, nice tight loops, no problem whatsoever, putting that line out and just pausing over the top. So this is a very, very small wrist type of cast using a precision grip, okay? I can do a backhand cast over my shoulder. Very easy and very effortless. If I go to a longer line, all right? This is about a 28 foot line on a 12 foot rod. So we're talking 38 feet without any leader or tippet. You'll notice it looks more traditional as in traditional fly fishing rod and reel type of cast. Now I'm engaging my arm, my shoulder, and my grip has changed because I'm moving more line. But again, it's very easy to cast and makes really nice, beautiful loops, no problem whatsoever. And when you're using longer lines on a Tenkar rod um, and you can't shoot or haul line, you actually do a lot of roll casting and spay type casting to lift your line and get your fly up in the air. But these are all very transferable skills, okay? Learning to recognize the load in your rod, learning the timing, what it feels like, and then being able to adjust and modify and respond to not only your rod, but your line length, okay? And so, 
getting on a rod and reel becomes very, very easy and very intrinsic. It's very easy to step over. Okay, let's go to our next layer. All right, fly patterns and presentations, a huge, huge rabbit hole, as we said before. So in Tenkara, traditionally, you fish with a fly that really doesn't look like anything at all. So this picture here is a, uh, a photo of a Sakasa Kabari. And you'll notice that it is a hackle forward fly. And if you are a tire and you're looking at this, you're saying, wow, that is a super easy, easy tie to fly, which is kind of great because in Tankara, really, if you're going to be very traditional about it, it's not about matching the hatch. Uh, or choosing the right fly as much as what you do with the fly. Because these rods are so sensitive and so delicate, you can really get a lot of action and create very different movements with a single fly or any fly for that matter. But a Sakasa Kabari is really unique because I can put some floating on that and I can skitter that across the surface and fish it like a dry fly. I can let it sink and then pulse it through the water almost like an attractor or wet fly once that hackle starts moving underneath the surface. So with one fly, I can do a whole lot of things with it. And the idea is that you're focusing on the presentation and you have this super flexible rod that allows you to get really good at working the fly, okay? And you get to be sort of a master at this one fly, right? And it's an easy fly to tie. So if you wanna start tying flies, it's a great place to start. But what's cool is that it simplifies it, especially for the beginner. Now I wanna clarify, I fish everything on my Tinkar rod, okay? I throw streamers, I nymph, I throw eggs and split shots. I throw woolly buggers. I do dry droppers. I throw clousers and mantis shrimp and crabs. I throw everything on my tankar rod. So even though in traditional tankara, it's not about matching the hatch and it's using these very um, indescript Sakasa Kabari flies, you can set your, your Takar rod up with any kind of a fly uh, setup that you want, okay? You can tie anything on. You can set up your Takar rod exactly as you would set up your regular rod and reel. But for people just getting into fly fishing, it's a, it simplifies it. It lets them start with one fly and really master manipulating and those presentations, different presentations before they move on and, you know, com complicate their life and their fly box with the millions of flies that we all have and love, okay? Um, and again, learning how to work and maneuver it is really um, a huge skill that Many um, anglers don't really spend a lot of time um, learning about. Sometimes you can, you can cast a fly and a fish won't move to it, but all of a sudden, if you add some motion or movement to that exact same pattern, all of a sudden you'll produce interest and you'll get a strike and you haven't changed the fly. You've just changed what you're doing with the fly. So 
Tenkara really allows you to do those very delicate manipulations and to practice and spend some time at it. Personally, I'll just share with you before we move on real quickly. I uh, used to, by friends, be called the dry fly queen. Magically, whenever I approached a river, there was a hatch and it was like magic. And so I used to always uh, fish uh, dry flies because, you know, it. I had this wonderful uh, experience with them and I was very lucky. And when I started to do nymphing, I was terrible at it. I sucked at the hook set because I was so, I, I got so habituated to watching that take that suddenly when you, you took that take away and it went under, you know, you, you went subsurface, my timing was really, really terrible. And so I vowed one summer to get better at nymphing. And I went out with my tank car rod and I tied on my midges and my nymphs and I did not use an indicator. Okay. I was like, you know, going bare bones here. I was going to do it all by feel. And by the end of the summer, I mean, the beginning of the summer was terrible. I missed a million fish. Okay. But by the end of the summer, I got so good at setting that hook strictly by feel, just by sensation and identifying those little nibbles on the end of that super, super fine tenkar rod. And when I say super fine, I really mean super fine. This is the end of a tenkara rod. So it is very, 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 very thin, okay? And you feel every little tick and bump. All right, let's move on. So, oops, setting the hook. I like to say setting the hook on a tenkara rod is equivalent uh, or to, uh, to a comparison between, you know, doing something with latex gloves or winter mittens. One is more sensitive, it's more flexible, it's ultralight, and it delivers more tactile feedback. So imagine tying a fly with a with wearing winter mittens versus wearing latex gloves. And I, I use that analogy because so much of the time people get stuck on this. You know, they're casting, they're getting fish to go to their, to, to strike their fly, but they're not setting the hook. And I've worked with so many anglers where, you know, I've stood next to them and said, that's a fish, that was a fish, that was a fish, that was a fish. And they're missing all of these hook sets because it's so hard to feel those little ticks, all right? And, you know, many times I will just, you know, stand next to them and pap, 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 that's a fish, that's a fish. And setting the hook on a tin car rod is just that. It's almost like flicking a wet towel in a locker room. It, that's the movement. Because you're using a short line, generally speaking, and it's a good place when you're starting to learn Tenkara to use that short setup. When you're, when you're maneuvering or you're following your fly down river, everything is tight, okay? There is no slack in the line, right? Because you've got this short setup, this short line. So when the fish hits that fly, they almost are setting themselves. Okay, because everything's tight. All they have to do is that. That's the movement to set the hook. It's very small, but because there's, there's no extra line, they're not taking anything off a reel, they connect with the fish. Okay, so setting the hook is much easier to learn on Tenkara and the feedback and identifying and cueing in on those ticks is much more exaggerated. So this is the juicy part, the play. And this is something that 
we talked about extensively in yesterday's presentation is what I call fish geometry or the fishing triangle, okay? On a Tenkara rod, you don't have a reel, so you have no extra line, okay? But you do have greater sensitivity and feedback. The discrete tactile cues are intensified, right? So fish management becomes intrinsic. You can feel what that fish is doing in a much more dramatic way. And you have to rely on fundamental skills versus the real. You don't have a real, you don't have a choice. So you learn to respond to the fish. And in doing so, your understanding of rod dynamics increases. So in this picture to the left, in this, my little drawing here, these bottom diagrams, these bottom two pictures are essentially, if you're on a rod and reel, that's when the fish is running, okay? And they're ripping line off of your reel, all right? And in those moments, you have very little control over the fish. You're not steering, you're not doing, you're just trying to stay connected to that fish. And you're doing that through your drag system, all right? Up here, these next two going up, or the, little, the middle two, are where, you know, I call that the warning zone. You're either regaining control and bringing your rod tip back up, or you're in the process of losing it and allowing the fish to run and coming back down here. So this is sort of like, what are you going to do when you're in this position? Are you going to bring the rod tip down and let the fish run? Or are you going to bring the rod tip back and get back under control? Up here, these top two triangles is where you have the most control over a fish, right? On a rod and reel. When you're in that 90 degree, roughly sweet spot with your fish, you usually have a lot of pressure on the fish and a lot of control over the fish. It's often where you, the position you get into as you're landing the fish. Now on a Tenkara rod, you can't ever go down here, all right? That is not an option because you don't have any line. So if that rod straightens out, game over, all right? A straight rod in Tenkara is bad news. You lose the fish, you're done. So in Tenkara, letting the fish run is never an option. Instead, you have two choices, and that is to control or steer the fish. Five minute warning, Karen. Uh, oh boy, oof. All right, <laughs> we're gonna go really fast, guys. So with Tenkara, when that fish starts to run and get into what I call the danger zone, all right, which is the red, area of this diagram, you have to respond by flipping your rod over and changing the direction that the fish is going in, in order to maintain control. Ooh, boy, this is rushing. So this is what that looks like. The fish runs. I have to take a step or two forward to get a little space and then I bring the fish back around to the other side with my rod in order to get back into that power position, okay? And in doing so, in flipping that rod over to the other side, what I'm doing is I'm getting back into that triangle, right? Because this is bad, all right? When I am only using the top of my rod 
I am not using the backbone, the strongest section of the rod. So in Tenkara, you've got to spread the load. You've got to evenly distribute the pressure of that fish along the entire length of the rod so that you are actually engaging the bottom half of the rod, which is your strongest section. So when I work off to the side, about a 45 degree angle off the water, I spread the load and I evenly distribute that load along the entire length of the rod. So now I'm managing the fish, not with you know two feet of rod, but now with 12 feet of rod. And in doing so, I create this beautiful 90 degree triangle. And now I'm back in control. And whenever you're in control, you will notice that you have that triangle in place. Now with a traditional setup and a short line, this is kind of what a landing looks like. And I use this diagram because I'm not very good at computer graphics, but my biggest issue with this is that in this photo, they're overloading the top section of the rod. And in doing so, he's not engaging the bottom half. And then when he reaches out in front of him and transfers this line back into this hand, he's actually putting more pressure on the top and will be pulling it down. So this dude in this picture is probably going to break his rod. All right. Now, if you have a short line, you can do this landing. And it's effective if you have a short line, but instead of grabbing here, you want to reach down, bend at the waist, and grab here. If you grab here and draw this line and transfer it into this hand, then you will actually be releasing the pressure off the top. All right. And what that looks like is this for a landing. Now I'm keeping a triangle and I have to flip the rod because the fish is trying to go to the right side, he wants to wrap my line in that log. So I'm pulling back, I've got my, my fishing triangle, that beautiful nice, nice degree triangle. I'm going in to grab my line, but he wants to move to the right. So I have to flip my rod to the left, reestablish, the pressure and grab the line down. And in doing so, I release the pressure off the top and I bring my fish in. And it's very, very easy and calm. I'm gonna show you this because I know we're running out of time. Um, in this, I put my rod tip, my rod in the water, which normally I don't do. I don't know why I do it, do it in this one, but, You'll see um, I'm casting, I actually cast with my left hand in that, if you, if you notice that, just because there's all these branches and there's this deep hole right where um, these fish like to hang out in here, but there are all these branches. And I have a streamer and I'm just moving it ever so slightly, giving it a little bit of motion. And you'll see in a minute, I connect. There's a nice deep run in there and there it is. I'm on the fish and you can see that triangle. Immediately he runs right there and I reestablish. And I just wanna show you that real quickly. So in Tenkara, you and the flex of your rod becomes the drag system. So I'm not running, and you'll see this is a good size fish, but he tries to straighten my rod out. And I take a quick step or two to get back in that power position right there. I move forward. And as I move forward, I bring the rod tip back. And I have a relatively short setup there, you can see, but it's a really deep hole right in there. Um, you gotta love the, the cement 
brick in the river there. <laughs> but I'm just keeping steady pressure on him. He's not going anywhere. Kind of working 45 degrees. I'm never holding the rod up over my head. It's off to the side. So I keep that, that load, that the curve uh, broad and open. And then I'm gonna do my helicopter move and I reach in and I just grab that line. And I put the rod down, which is fine. It floats, it's connected. Um, I'm not really sure why I did that, but I did. Can't find my net, but you'll see here. It's a good sized fish. That's a pretty good fish. And that's as simple as that. So, in Tinkara, you're working on foundational skills, okay? So on these rods, because they're so sensitive and ultra lightweight, you're getting more feedback. So when you get more feedback, you're actually able to learn faster because those cues are more dramatic. So your learning curve increases because you know what you're actually looking for. It's kind of like getting hit in the head, you know, with a brick rather than somebody tapping you delicately on the shoulder. Because you're learning faster, you have more success. When you have success at something, you generally tend to do it more. When you do something more, in essence, you are actually practicing it. And that additional practice means improvement. And all of that, all of that that you're learning are transferable skills into a rod and reel. And that is my presentation. <laughs> um, yeah, we got, I mean, we may get chased out of the room for the next presentation, but um, Joe asked a good question. I'll ask it for you, Joe. Yes. Um, is there a relationship to the Tenkara rod used and the ability to cast various flies? So if he wanted to fish a clouser, how does he know the limits on the weight of the fly and what Tenkara to use? Yes. So different rods will cast different flies and lines. And so that is sort of a manufacturer issue. Certainly a stiffer rod is going to be able to cast essentially a heavier or bigger fly, but you have to be careful because if the rod is simply stiff, then it can break under pressure, okay? Um, and, it, and if it doesn't have that flex to give. So there's that balance and that ratio between flex and strength. So yes, so you would want to talk to the manufacturer um, of your Tenkara rod to get a sense of what it's capable of um, and you know what, what type of lines it can cast. Um, or you can also experiment yourself. Yeah, and be sure um, she did open up a meetup room if you want to talk more because, um, Kathy, do you want to ask your question? Kathy Crofts? Uh, when I was looking at 10 car rods, I was focused a little bit more on the seven to three or the six to four ratio. Can you just mention that for a moment? Yes. So in Tenkara, um, traditionally, you, dis you talk about rods being a length and a flex. And the flex represents a ratio between the percentage of, of, of that rod that is stiff and the percentage that is softer or flexible. So a 7-3 rod means that 70% of the rod is considered stiff and 30% flexes. So that would be a faster tip action uh, rod. A 5-5 uh, five, five flex rod would be a what they call full action rod or 50% is stiff, 50% flexes. So it's going to flex and bend much uh, deeper and be a slower action rod. Now, um, those can be very, very hard. I've 
actually written some articles about that because it doesn't really tell you what the what the capability of that rod is. So that is something that as you kind of get into Tinkara, you need to inquire with different companies and manufacturers. Um, Zen, which is uh, my company, Zen Tinkara, we are the only company that assign a fray weighting, fray rating to our rods. That is a fly rod approximate equivalency. So we have a three weight fray rating on our Suzumi rod. We have a seven weight fray rating on our Sagi rod. And that gives, not only do you know the length of the rod and what the flex profile is, whether it's a 6.4, a 7.3, a 5.5, five, or an 8.2, but it will also give you an idea of what you will utilize or what you could utilize that rod for and what the capacity of that rod is, so. And a lot of the chat blew up on what a good presenter and what a educational presentation it was. So oh, well, thank, thank you, you, Karen. You're getting lots of love out there. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, and lots of clapping from the crowd. <laughs> Look at that. You are oh, love. You are love. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I know you probably all have to go to another presentation, but I will go into uh, the little virtual meetup room in case anybody isn't rushing off to another location and please feel free to reach out to me directly if you have questions or if there's something that I didn't clarify or you want to know more about. And I, I put your happy. email in chat right away but it's but it's Karen K-A-R-I-N at Zen Fly Fishing Gear one word Zen Fly Fishing Gear dot com. Yep. All right. Okay. Thank you Thank everyone. You everybody. Thank you so much. Bye. <laughs>